My name is Marilisa, Marilisa Shimazumi, and it's a great pleasure to be with you all here at the Dizal web webinar. Um, today's event, today's lecture is going to be on assessment for learning, carrying out formative assessment in EFL contexts. Um, I'll start very briefly introducing myself. Um, my name is Marilisa. I am currently the coordinator for the undergrad uh, courses at Faculdade de Cultura Inglesa, both the Licenciatura Letras and Bacharelado de Tradução. But above all, I am a teacher, uh, and this is what I enjoy most doing which is teaching and working with my learners. Uh, the session today has as its main aims to discuss concepts in the area of assessment and describe assessment practices other than testing. Uh, I have divided, if you could see in my outline, in my abstract, the presentation in two parts, essentially. I will tackle a, a more theoretical part in the beginning, identifying assessment principles intrinsically related to a more formative view of teaching and learning. And then I plan to describe and discuss with you all uh, ways to implement some assessment tools and tasks that perhaps you could use to monitor and or check whether learning is taking place in your classrooms. I do hope you have time for questions at the very end. So I plan to allocate some time for us to, uh, to chat along, okay, after the session. Okay. Um, I'll start then by narrowing down here that we'll be placing the focus of our, uh, of our session today, although it is on assessment for learning, but for learning of whom we are talking about our learners, essentially. So the focus here is going to be on what our learners say, on what our learners do, and what they produce in our classrooms so that we can better able to monitor and to gauge whether learning is actually taking place. So, but to start with, I'd like you to have a look at uh, um, these two pictures here. Please uh, just ignore the, the quote for the time being. Uh, I am showing here the first photograph, and I've placed here uh, learning, some kind of learning is taking place as well as here. But as you can see in both pictures, the interaction of, between the learners here amongst the learners is quite different, uh, the environment. So in here, we have what we could call it assessment of learning taking place, whereas here we have assessment for learning. Uh, I'll start by differentiating these two concepts because these will allow us to progress throughout our sessions. So when I talk about assessment of learning, I'm mentioning, I'm referring to something extremely valid in our courses, extremely valid in our practices as teachers, which is to try and diagnose our learners in terms of what they can do, in terms of their progress. So in here, in assessment of learning, uh, we are focusing on using, applying instruments or even procedures like tests, we are very familiar with tests, uh, used uh, primarily to measure attainment, to measure progress. And typically, 
they report back this learning in terms of scores and results. Extremely valid uh, means of checking learning. We have, on the other hand, assessment for learning. Assessment for learning here takes uh, as its main focus um, the design of tasks and in which we can provide feedback to our learners to support the teaching and learning process. I am quoting here uh, Dave Allen, but I think other authors they also mention about this dichotomy of assessment of learning, which tends also to be called summative assessment and assessment for learning, the formative mode of assessment. On that note, having already now defined the difference between these two perspectives of assessment, I'd like to quote here uh, William and Black, Dylan, William and Paul Black in their 1996 work. They've mentioned something extremely important. Although there is this dichotomy of summative assessment and formative assessment, assessment of learning and for learning, let me quote it here. The same assessment can be used both formatively and summatively in the terms formative and summative make much more sense as descriptors of the function that assessment data serve rather than of the assessment themselves. So what's behind it? Uh, it very much depends on our purpose. Uh, what are we aiming at? Are we after focusing? Are we focusing on the process of learning so you will probably pay attention and uh, spend much more time in the what's going on here uh, what what's taking place throughout the process of learning or we are actually at a particular moment in time focusing on the results on what students can actually do so are we focusing on a snapshot, a particular moment in time on what they can do, a summative assessment, or more on an ongoing, just like a movie instead of a snapshot, a movie, what they can do throughout a series of events. Today, I plan to spend some time with you talking about assessment for learning. However, I would like still to emphasize that the test itself is still and it remains a valuable tool to check whether learning has taken place. Okay, I don't, uh, this is not my intention to invalidate tests at all. But the aim of my session is to discuss other ways of checking whether learning is taking place other than using tests, making use of tests. Um, some time ago, um, I've, um, I had the pleasure and uh, the privilege of watching Professor Gladys Quevedo and Professor Gordon Stobart giving, each of them giving their lectures. And uh, funnily enough and interesting in, enough, both lecturers mentioned uh, this particular um, this particular uh, aspect of learning. Uh, Professor Gladys said in her talk that we should be focusing on preparing our learners for the changing nature of the world of work. Whereas Professor and also Professor Go uh, Stobart, Gordon Stobart said that we also should be preparing our learners for the deep learning 
versus surface learning. And by deep learning, Professor Gordon Stobart was focusing on the ability to think for themselves. So, I am also sharing with you a, a figure produced by a student of ours from our postgrad course. She was a supervisee of mine. She has just finished her work on the competencies, key competencies for language learners in the 21st century. And um, amongst many competencies, she has selected these 10 key competencies that our learners should be better able to do. They should be better able to think critically, to collaborate. They should be able to expand their creativity skills in order to do things differently, to communicate. They should have computer literacy cultural and global awareness, career and life competence, citizen values and community contribution. They should seek continuous improvement and they should also develop, develop a concern for sustainability. So all these 10 key competences, they are related to what Professor Aguevedo and Professor Stobart also mentioned in their talk. We are, at the end of the day, preparing our language learners to function properly in the world of work that demands much more than merely memorizing recalling, identifying information. What I'm trying to say to you is that we should be now trying to focus on preparing our learners and then assessing them while developing their higher order thinking skills. Let me explain to you this figure here. What you can see on the left hand side, the first triangle is Bloom's 1956 original taxonomy of thinking skills. And then this specific taxonomy has been um, revisited by Anderson and Kraftwall in 2001 bearing in mind specific skills that workers in the 21st century or employers seek in candidates applying for, for their particular posts. So according to Bloom's taxonomy, we have three lower level thinking skills, they are lower level thinking skills, but they are extremely important as well. So having uh, the ability to understand and recognize information. So remembering, understand, recognize, recall, understand it and being able to use it. Let me share the next screen so that it becomes a bit clearer here. So, According to Bloom, remembering refers to the ability our learners have to use their memories, to, to use their memories to recognize, identify, recall facts, facts and concepts. They can also compare and contrast information. They can think, they can work together, they can share information. By understanding information, they can also interpret, classify, uh, apply. They can use learning, whatever it is that they are learning, in multiple and individualized ways. They can, for instance, do some brainstorming, execute a procedure to solve a problem. They are all extremely important skills. However, the criticisms in the literature of assessment seems to be that we have been 
focusing too much at these particular levels here. They are called lower level thinking skills in our tests, in our tasks, in our teaching practices, and somehow um, leaving aside the top three higher level thinking skills, which according to the literature would better prepare our learners for the challenges in the workforce in the 21st century. So for example, we should also be preparing our learners to make meaning by doing what? Analyzing, by breaking information into parts. So helping our learners to dissect and analyze information through its parts, through its components, determining how the parts are related to each other and to the whole. Our learners should also be able to evaluate information to evaluate data and concepts. So they should be able to combine, connect, judge, put ideas together, involve themselves into peer review, self-evaluation, and they should obviously be able to create. This is the creative level, the creative skills level. It's not related to talent in itself, but it's related to a certain level of ability that allows our learners to generate something new by planning and producing, by reorganizing existing elements to form a new structure. It is very much what we say, thinking outside the box. So we get a pre-existing body of knowledge and we are, our students are able to think and plan and produce something different out of this. So going back to my major focus of this session, we are assessing for learning. But what kind of learning do we want our learners to be better able to do? We want our learners to be functioning here in the world of work of the 21st century. And these are the skills and major competencies we want our learners to be mastering so that they are able to do all those things. And mind you, if you are able to generate something new out of pre-existing knowledge, you are, it, it's also, it encapsulates all the other levels here. So um, this top higher order thinking skills are tremendously useful and competences that we should be sharing and preparing our learners in, in our practices. On that note, so, if you look at this particular level here at the bottom, I'd like to share what normally tends to take place in the classrooms. Sometimes uh, we do that if we are focusing on form, but we have to watch out, which is um, the classroom discourse pattern that we employ in our rooms, which we run the risk of focusing at these levels here instead of making our learners think reflectively and think critically. So have a look at one of the examples. This is the, the famous IRE uh, exchange model by Sinclair and Coulthard. Um, and uh, these two linguists, they have examined a, an immense body of uh, exchanges in the classroom and they have noticed that the major pattern in the classroom is this. I stands for, yes, Malcolm Coulthard, that's it, Mauro. Uh, the teacher normally initiates the conversations, the interactions in the classroom. 
the student responds and the teacher evaluates. That's the IRF or F for feedback or R I I R E for evaluation. And it's always based on their research. It's always the teacher that initiates more often. However, let's have a look at the sort of questions, this questioning pattern that takes place in the classroom. What time is it? It's eight o'clock. Good, it is eight o'clock. Well done. Exactly. What does IRL, I-R-E or F? Initiation, response, E for evaluation here. Or F for feedback, if we try and simulate more real life conversation. But what um, Kulfad and Sinclair found out was that predominantly in the classroom, we, I myself, I include myself in there when we are practicing and I am practicing language with my learners, IRE. Now, have a look at the problem here. The focus on the questions here are on information that we teachers, we already know. Actually, the questions are just excuses to check whether they know how to pronounce the words, whether they know how to give the correct answers. So they are not genuine questions. And as Mauro has mentioned here, none absolutely uh, information exchange being taken place. So where does it take us? Going back to what I have shown you. Yeah, here, right? What we are doing is making students recognize, identify information, replicate, memorize, drill, use, that's great, that's good. But I do think that assessment, if we are aiming at assessing learning, assessment for learning, I think we should be a bit more ambitious and go a bit higher here at the pyramid. So in order to do that, as my second part of, of the session here is to share with you some ways to implement formative learning in the classroom. Uh, it's more process oriented. It doesn't take, in, it doesn't happen in one session, in one class. It takes longer, but the students get used to it and they become, they perform uh, more realistically. So I am going to share with you uh, five here, five suggestions that I extracted from Fisher and Frey. You will have the bibliography at the end of the session. And then I will uh, share with you one example from one of my groups at the Faculdade, working with a higher order thinking skills. Okay, so my main aim here is to make all this more abstract and theoretical principles I have shared with you a bit more and make it a bit more tangible. So I'm going to describe how to work with and suggest these five procedures, accountable talk, value lineups, retelling, think, pair, share, can do lists. Again, I will ask you, uh, please, to bear in mind whether students are doing this. Are they able to break information down into parts? Have they been able to put ideas together, negotiate with their peers? Are they able to generate something new based on pre-existing information? Or they are just replicating, and that's okay, but replicating, memorizing, identifying information. So the first procedure and the first um, 
uh, uh, let's say, suggestion that we could perhaps be tackling the more higher order thinking skills is the accountable talk. Oh, sorry. My bad here. Uh, so as you could see that we are shifting a bit in doing that, the role of the learner from passively, as Linda Darling Hammond mentioned, from passively receiving and responding to questions. And these questions are uh, whose answers we teachers already know. We are actually making our learners take increasing initiative for finding and making sense of information, determining questions, methods, and strategies for investigation. And apologies for, for my birds. They are typically, untypically active today. So, accountable talk. According to this particular procedure, students, we could engage students in active learning through, look at this, inquiry-based tasks. Inquiry-based tasks, meaning involving students in thinking tasks. So uh, we could uh, uh, suggest and do it systematically in class by whenever they respond to us, press them for clarification and for explanation. These are simple questions that tapping to go deep into what our learners are actually thinking about, how they are thinking about. So you could, depending on what they answer, you could ask them, could you describe what you mean? Sorry, I didn't get it. Could you say that again? Could you describe what you mean here? So he will naturally stop and rethink a bit more carefully what he said. Uh, require justification of proposals and challenges. Hmm. So when you are checking, so again, we are assessing learning, right? After a reading comprehension question, ask them, so where did you find that information? Could you tell me? Could you show me? Are you sure? So recognize and challenge misconceptions. If the information is not correct, Ask students one another, do they agree, do they disagree? But it's not only that, why? Ask them to uh, recognize incongruences, misinformation, and to correct them. Demand evidence for claims and arguments. Can you give an example? Simple like that, simple. Um, interpret and use each other's statements. So you suggested that, by the way, number five, it seems very easy, but it's quite complex, which means it means that you have to understand what your student has said, paraphrase it and ask them to agree or disagree and position themselves. Uh, interpret, what, what do I mean by interpret? Understand. Understand each other's statement. Or if you don't understand it, ask for clarification. Here we go again. Demand evidence or here. Sorry, could you say that again? It's, it's really being as the name of the task, which means we are working with questions, questions and answers. We are not advocating for this. I R E any longer, which is the more automatic, robotic sort of exchanges. We are actually interacting with our learners and asking them to be accountable for what they say, take ownership for what they say. What they say matters in the classroom, but they, they should be prepared to explain their positioning. So a very simple task 
which might help us assess their learning is via questions and questions based on inquiry, on reflection, on thinking, on understanding their discourse. Procedure number two, value lineups. This is a bit for the, the groups, which are more uh, oriented towards physical uh, movements. Um, so we have here, providing learners with opportunities for fostering peer discourse. So what we could do, okay, which would also trigger some more uh, 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 thinking skills, reflective skills here from the part of the learners. The students are asked to evaluate a statement and instructed to line up according to their agree of uh, to their degree of agreement or disagreement with the statement. Line up, I mean standing up and positioning themselves in the specific uh, side of the classroom that is that that it is um, related to their thinking, to their opinions. So after forming a single line, the queue is then folded in half so that the students who mostly agree and mostly disagree with one another are placed face to face. The students then discuss their reasons for their positions and they have to listen to the perspectives of their partners. This cultivates a broader understanding of differences in the classroom, of the distinctions of understanding on a topic. It, it also fosters diversity of opinions, differences, and tolerance. Okay, we have differences in, 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 in opinions. Let's hear your point of view. So... Uh, the teacher here can listen in as pairs put forward their opinions and can note the ways in which they share their responses and take notes of feedback. So here, in, they have to listen and debate and check the reasons. Let me go back to here. So they are judging Look at here, analyzing and evaluating. They are judging, they are putting ideas together, they are involving into peer review, they are talking, they have to negotiate meanings, um, and they have to make sure the information is correctly understood. Uh, Thais, could we say metacognition? Metacognition is essential feature of formative assessment to a reasonable extent. Well, I, I'm not going to fully uh, associate it with metacognitive skills, but it's definitely um, reasoning skills to a reasonable extent, but being able to position yourself into a thinking being, someone with opinion and being able to justify. And for that, using the language, using English to do things. So uh, th th this has to do with our view of language. Language for us shouldn't be a set of rules to be memorized. Rather, language should be used to allow us to do things in the world. And one of the things is to be accountable for what we say. So this is important. And not just follow the IRE, respond to a question to which I know my teacher already knows the answer. Yes, language is a tool. Absolutely. It's a tool for you to become an autonomous citizen while using the language. Okay, value lineups. Uh, okay. Retelling, we could invite, we could invite students to retell what they have just heard or read. And when we do that, we are using a powerful tool for checking their understanding. Okay, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really good. Ask them to repeat what they have said. 
ask them to repeat what they have just heard and you will be astonished to know to, to notice that perhaps they have had some misunderstandings so in here well you will be able to see the presentation later on i know it's small but you have a series of registers from oral to oral i'll, I'll do one example with you so how can we ask our learners to retell information. The students have to process information and then, this is very hard, very complex. They have to summarize what they have understood. So, oral to oral. The students listen to a selection, whatever, to an extract and they have to retell it orally. Oral to written. They listen to a an extract, and they have to retell it in writing. Um, at the Faculdade, and I, I have seen some, some of my students here with us today, which is great. We have a particular discipline, which is Compreensão e Produção Oral. They have to listen to lecturers and lectures, and they have to summarize it in writing. This is an extremely important skill, which is checking for their understanding of a particular lecture. And it's quite hard, they find it. So this is it, retelling from oral to written, from oral to video. You listen to an extract and then you video yourself retelling the same piece of information. And it goes on and on. It is amazing, but it means uh, Sandra says, it seems, it, is, it also seems to handle critical reading skills. I think it's a multi skills uh, task in this sense, but not only um, reading, writing, listening, speaking. Well, yeah, the four skills are definitely involved, yes, Sandra, but above all, they are using, they are making use of the skills to manipulate in the good sense to articulate their thinking skills uh, and their ability to process information. And this is what we are after in our assessment. Are our students uh, able to retell information accurately? And this takes time, I think. This takes some practice. Let me go for the other one, think, pair, share. It's a cooperative discussion strategy. Remember, one of the key competences of the 21st century, employers want our their possible employees to have is collaboration. So they should be able to cooperate in class, to argue for their position, but also to accept differences. So and it's always good when you give them a task don't start by correcting straight away. So give them this think, pair, share moment, this procedure. Think. The teacher engage, engages students thinking with one question, with a prompt, with a visual or observation, with a task. You ask them to think about a problem, okay? So students should take a few minutes minutes, not seconds, to think about their task. And instead of correcting straight away, give them some time to exchange opinions using designated partners, pair up students so that they can discuss their answers. They can perhaps be reassured of, okay, have I understood correctly? So they compare their thoughts uh, and identify the responses they think are the best, most intriguing, most convincing, or most unique. I'll go with you, Janaki, just a moment. Uh, and then after thinking for themselves and having had the opportunity to share with a colleague and get some more reassurance, now it's time to share. I think they are better prepared than to talk in pairs for a few moments and then 
share their thinking with the rest of the class. They will feel much more confident, less vulnerable, more reassured. Uh, and here, naturally, there are opportunities to check for understanding throughout the whole thing, pair and share. We can go and move around, or, well, we can visit them in the different breakout rooms, depending whether we are teaching online or gen boards. The teacher can listen in as pairs, discuss their responses, note the ways in which they are sharing their responses, and then be prepared to give them feedback. By the way, everyone, feedback, I was thinking about feedback as feed forward. How can I, my feedback, my comments, better prepare to cater for future productions, what they can do better, okay? So, Yanaki, Janaki, uh, is it possible to use the written and think pair share assessments with any level of student? I would say so. Obviously, yes, I would uh, be careful and make the necessary adaptations. And uh, the, the, the triangle there, the pyramid, Bloom's pyramid, everyone, I think it's applicable to all levels and, and uh, age groups. Uh, but obviously, we have to make sure we adapt it, okay, to their uh, appropriate uh, level. Um, and the last one, the fifth uh, suggestion I would like to give you in order to make it more tangible, some tasks that could favor your assessment in class. Um, in, uh, using, implementing, making use of response cards, hand signals. And this should be processual. I mean, should be done consistently. And then they get the hang of it. They get the use of it. It's a can-do check. I am sure most of you now already make use of it. So you can use post-it cards or hand signals, uh, yellow, uh, or red and green, okay, to show uh, thumbs up. I understand this and I can explain it and then give them a, a room to explain. Uh, I'm not completely sure about, I do not, I do not yet understand X, Y, and Z. I can see this happening as self-assessment, perhaps together in, peers, sorry, in pairs or in mini groups, try to get their minds, their heads around something. Uh, and uh, this is a good way of empowering them and letting them know how well they, they, they think they have understood what they have talked about. Uh, the previous slide, none at all. Here it is. Alan. Okay, think, pair, share. This is the fourth uh, procedure. And the, the fifth procedure is the can-do check, which, whichever material, heads up, uh, waving, whatever, signaling. So students here would be reaching out to you by saying, yes, I'm okay, no, I'm not. Can you say that again? in the same way as you are doing here with me via the chat mode. Now, I'd like to share with you, okay, I have given you some suggestions. These are suggestions, and believe me, this work a lot. Uh, I have been using this in different groups. I am going to share with you my um, use, my uh conscious use of Bloom's taxonomy, more specifically the higher level uh, order skills. I, I call it HOTS, H-O-T-S, higher order thinking skills, the HOTS skills with my students at the faculty level. So uh, that's it, HOTS, Fet Mauro, higher order thinking skills. Um, I told you I teach uh, 
at the faculty and I have both bacharelado groups and uh, licenciatura groups. Uh, this was uh, in one particular group of mine, they were, uh, they are working, this, this is a group which works with the Desenvolvimento de Escrita Académica in English. So they have to develop their uh, writing skills in academic English. Uh, I have, for obvious reasons, masked their faces, but you can see me here. It's a Zoom class. We are doing it virtually, remote learning. And uh, what they have to do was, at the end of the day, my aim was, are they able to understand diverse points of view and single out information where people agree with each other, information where people, well, uh, are they able to identify, look, identify the bottom of the pyramid, advantages, disadvantages, and which authors, okay, here we have the names of authors, it's academic writing, so I gave them a list of some books and articles, and in blue is just a short summary of each article, each summary, uh, each, each book related to the use of genre analysis in writing. So the question, my task was primarily identify and go to gen board in groups. So working collaboratively, accepting divergence information. So put the names of the authors who see genre analysis as having only advantages and which authors see genre analysis as disadvantages. And give me the authors here, you have to read, understand, recognize the authors that are in the middle of the road. They see both advantages and disadvantages, okay? This, is, this was the first part. Uh, none at all, here it, here it is, so we have, this is the pyramid. So what I'm trying to do with the first task on gen board is for them, first they have to read the list of authors and my mini summary of each of those works. There were articles and books and they had to recognize are the authors talking about the advantages of genre analysis disadvantages of genre analysis to improve writing or they see both. So they are here, I would say, recognizing words, reading the text, they are understanding concepts, but they are also classifying information. They are brainstorming and they are executing a procedure to solve a problem. Which problem? They have to put in the different containers. Which authors do what? They are working in groups, higher order, thinking skills. These are the HOTs. These are the higher order thinking skills, the ones that I have circled. And the ones that I have been talking about in the session, they are those which are somehow not worked through in our activities, in our practices in class, and they are not assessed as they should. And mind you, the higher order thinking skills, again, are the sort of thinking skills that proponents of the 21st century skills advocate for that we should be preparing uh, the, uh, in, um, in citizens of the future to have. So how come they can have and develop those skills if they are not practicing it in the classrooms, okay, to think properly? Uh, okay, so going back, so here they are, so my students were doing that, so 
they worked in different breakout rooms and they came up with a particular listing. Hot, higher order thinking skills analysis. So here I am trying to make them understand meanings, explore, asking for pros and cons, so advantages, disadvantages. They had to break information into parts and then place it in the correct positioning. In here, I could already assess one thing, whether they could read properly. Are they able to read the information I gave here? And are they able to place it in the correct position. So only by doing this, I could assess their reading skills. But I, my class is on writing. So this is my key, okay? This is what I had with me. So we had six authors, six groups of authors, and my students would have to have these. At the end of the whole module, this took this was a lesson of 100 minutes. They worked in groups, and this is a bit more difficult. They had to write collaboratively. So this is my group two. They had to write about the authors that saw these advantages in using genre analysis to improve writing. So this is what my students wrote, a number of writers have discussed the advantages and disadvantages of genre analysis for academic writing. One of the writers that discussed the disadvantages was Luke here, 1996. And they were also uh, practicing making integral references in texts. So th they used correctly. Who claimed that genre approach leads to formulaic writing? In addition to Luke's argument here, Hayan 2001 warned that students can overgeneralize genre rules. You might be thinking, yes, okay, Marilisa, they were able to put it, but they were copying here from, from the text itself. That's okay. I mean, uh, they didn't have too much time to articulate it, but for 100 minute class and it's academic writing, I was pretty much, I was very happy in getting them to read a text, being able to abstract it, uh, break it into different parts, categorize it in the correct positioning, according to the authors, and come up with a summary. Uh, and working in groups, so collaborating, agreeing, disagreeing, and write a very sensible and um, coherent piece of writing. Okay, what I'd like to come back to is, according to Linda Darling Hammond here, what I'm trying to show to you as well is, we have to be slowly, if we wanted to assess that learning is actually taking place and not only replication or mimicking or information that has been memorized, but actually learning is taking place in the classroom, we have to start thinking about the deeper learning skills that Professor Aguirredo mentioned, that Professor Stobart mentioned, the deeper thinking skills, the higher order thinking skills, the hot that Luis wrote here on the chat. And this deeper learning thinking skills, they are intricately, intrinsically related to the 21st century skills that employers are searching for. They, they, they want future employees to have those uh, abilities. So they want learners, well, in case the employers, they want candidates that are able to find information, evaluate, synthesize information, and use knowledge uh, in new contexts. They should be able to frame and solve 
non-routine problems, produce findings and solutions. They should be acquiring thinking skills, problem-solving skills, designing and communication skills. They should be able to present their views and defend their positions. They should be able to revisit their piece of writing based on feedback that we gave. And they should develop and demonstrate a range of skills here. And here, metacognitive skills. I think we have a colleague of ours here. Sorry, I'm coming back. Yes, uh, metacognitive skills. Somebody mentioned, sorry, I cannot go back. Uh, Thais, Thais, you said, could we say metacognitive skills is an essential feature of formative? It is one of, and it's here. Above all, we have here learning to learn skills and also some resilience, some tolerance and collaboration. Uh, I'm going to, we are almost finalizing. I'm going to end with someone I admire. Uh, President Obama back in 2009, quoted in Darling Hammond. And look here, he was already envision, envisioning already predicting the level of education back then in the US that it lacked focus on higher order thinking skills teaching. Look at here, I'm calling on our nation's governors and state education chiefs to develop standards and assessments that don't simply measure whether students can fill in a bubble on a test. You see multiple choice, a tick, circle the correct answer. Not only that, but whether they possess 21st century skills like problem solving, critical thinking, entrepreneurship, like creating new things, and creativity. So on, on that note, everyone, um, I'd like to open for question and answers, but I think I, I have been uh, answering your questions throughout, uh, but I'm going to check. Uh, I am leaving here my references. And if you allow me, I would like just a moment to inform you that next semester, the second semester of 2021, uh, we at the Faculdade de Cultura Inglesa will be offering a curso de extensão. Uh, it's, it's going to be uh, online due to obvious reasons. So it's great for people outside Sao Paulo. It's called Visible Learning and Assessment. You can scan here the, the, the QR code and get into the site or just check our site here at the Faculdade for more information. If, if, Okay, you happen to be more, uh, if you happen to be interested in more about assessment and visible learning. What is the best, let me just now check the questions here. It may, it may, it may, yeah. mm -hmm. What's the best reference on practical assessment activities? Um, I, I would say, uh, I haven't been, I have to be honest, okay, uh, Katya, I haven't been reading books that suggest practical ideas. Uh, I have been away a bit from, from this, uh, perhaps, uh, literature. Uh, but uh, the authors I have mentioned here, I mean, Fisher, 2007, Checking for Understanding, they give, look at here, formative assessment techniques, Katya, I would say. Uh, Fisher and Frey were the authors I quoted for the think, uh, pair, and share the, the, the signals, okay? Is the extension course only for graduates? So let me do th this here. Uh, is it like that? I am publishing. No, I'm not publishing the question. Yes, I am publishing the question. Model. Hang on a minute. 
Is the extension course only for graduates? I'm still in college. Uh, the curso de extensão. Uh, you are still in uh, college. You are still uh, uh, college. Okay, the the uh, the faculdade. Yes, you are much welcome. Very much welcome. In, if you are doing faculdade, curso de extensão. I'd like to have. Could you please send it? Uh, could you please send me by email? Well. Uh, I, I'm going to make this available to the Dizal here, but, but, uh, Thais, let me do the following. Why don't you take a picture of it now, okay? Just in case. Um, in a webinar like this, what model assessment do you have up your sleeve? What do you mean by that, Mauro? Sorry, I didn't get your question here. I am, um, I mean, my kind of assessment of, of the session here was from the amount, for example, of uh, uh, questions I get. The more questions and participation, I think something happened, something good happened because you are all uh, taking part. So in terms of assessment, here is by participation. If I understood your question here, how can I assess whether my session was productive or not. I think by the amount of, of um, uh, participation on the chat. Okay. Uh oh, so, uh, sorry, everyone. Thank you very much. I um, I'd like to, on behalf of the Faculdade, I'd like to thank you all for taking part in this afternoon. It was really a pleasure to talk about something very dear to me, which is assessment. Thank you very much. Hope to see you soon.